A mother enters her son's room to wake him for church. Wake up, son. It's time to go to church. The son with the bed covers over his head says emphatically, I'm not going. So the mother asks the son to give her two good reasons why he would not want to go to church today. Because they don't like me and I don't like them. Mother says, no, not good enough. Unmoved at her son's proclamation, continues to demand that he gets up and get ready to go to church. At which the son replies, give me two good reasons why I should go. Well, said the mother, because you're 52 years old. (laughs) And besides that, you're the minister. Boy, can I relate. (laughs) Hmm. Now, I'm going to um, put a disclaimer out there. I'm going to tell you in in advance that this reflection today is all about me. And I'm hoping by the end of it that you might get a little something out of it. But it's probably a little bit of a continuance of my therapy. But it's a good way for me to introduce myself to you. What better way can I introduce you to who I am but telling you all of my junk? (laughs) So here it is. Occasionally and almost always, eventually, something happens on one's journey that is capable of propelling them to the next level of this game we call life. Usually it is something shocking. And although many would consider this unfortunate, it normally takes something shocking or even traumatic to shake us out of our present status quo, out of the resemblance of the happy balance we think we may have. And to trust us into a and to rather to thrust us into a different reality, a reality we would, would not have otherwise. My personal journey here today has been wrought with a major story or with many stories and anecdotal stories, but it's led me from the depths of. Pentecostalism and being an independent Baptist pastor to the pursuit of ministerial fellowship with the Unitarian Universalist Association. Not always a quick and easy journey, (laughs) as you can imagine. And like for some of you, it came as a result of an existential crisis of faith. I can recall my life as an early convert to Christianity. I remember having what some call that born again experience in my youth when the notion of God was realized and my faith became alive. I remember the overwhelming sense of joy and satisfaction and the newness of life. Church leaders instructed me to trust in the word they said. But as I matured, my faith and understanding had to as well. And when life began to make, uh, when life began to make those pivotal uh, shifts, the Bible and religion began to lose their grips on me. You see, my father has spent most of his adult life and most of my entire life in prison. He was there because he had been involved with the deaths of three men on three different occasions. And when he was home, he was raising hell and creating havoc. I witnessed as my God-loving, faithful mother would, after years of abuse from my father, would suffer the loss of two of her sons, my brothers, 
who themselves would be brutally murdered on two separate occasions. And then to witness her and my grandmother and two of my sisters and two more brothers deal with the debilitating disease lupus. I had almost given up. And to add this to my personal struggles with identity as a married gay African-American man in the ministry certainly proved difficult. And if you knew me then, you might say that I was a stereotypical angry black man, angry at the world, at religion, and the image of what I thought or understood as God. And seminary only served to further affirm my dissatisfaction. What I was learning in school debunked much, if not all, of what I had been taught and what I was still preaching. <laughs> I felt hoodwinked, deceived, and cheated of all those years that I spent believing blindly. I was questioning everything, and I wanted everyone around me to question everything with me. If I'm going to be miserable, I want everybody else to be miserable, too. <laughs> But I wanted them to question their faith. I would draw people into an argument just to get a rise out of them. You couldn't reason with me. I, I felt undone. Something that a proper seminary education is, is supposed to do for people. I kept hearing, but it didn't help me at that moment. I had become a deconstructing discontent. Now, most of us know someone we might describe as a discontent. And if you don't know somebody, you just might be that person yourself. <laughs> uh, let me talk to your friends. <laughs> oh, we're going to have a little fun today. Is that okay? <laughs> but a discontent is not just someone who lacks contentment. No, there, there's a difference. They thrive on negativity. They are the ones who always view the glass as half empty. And in their story, Schrodinger's cat dies every time. They seem to never get over their hurts. And like me, I used to say, if you say good morning, I would ask, what's good about it? Many of us spend our lives constructing tales, belief systems, and ideologies, which then inform and enforce our realities. But when paradigms shift, old, outdated structures and traditions give way to new emerging ideas and new realities and blind spots and misconceptions about become exposed. Individuals may undergo crises suddenly needing to deconstruct decades of social conditioning. And that's where I was. I was stuck. However, however, du even during my crisis of faith, I still was trying to stay connected to a religious community. I was attending a church led by the trailblazing tele-evangelist and pastor Carlton Pearson, who was going through his own spiritual and religious crises. He was mentored by Oral Roberts, another famous Christian charismatic tele-evangelist, author and founder of Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Carlton Pearson became an advisor to Presidents Bill Clinton and, and George Bush. His annual Azusa conferences, which helped launch the ministries of, of T.D. Jakes and Joyce Myers, would see up to 50 or 60,000 people per event. His weekly Sunday school, um, Sunday church services drew nearly 6,000 on average in attendance. And his weekly offering was $60,000 offering. Now that, he had it going on. Yes. But it just so happened that one evening while sitting in his den, watching his big screen television, satisfied and content with the abundant and affluent life, he had an epiphany. 
And as he tells it, he was watching television and an infomercial came on about African people, about the plight of African people, mostly women and children, babies, as he described them, with skeletal bodies and no light or life in their eyes. And while he sat there with his fat cheeked baby and eating a plate full of food and he's cried out to God, how can you call yourself God when you let these people die and then you're going to usher them into hell? That's what he believed. And then he started having this dialogue with God who, and who God at the time said, I'm not sending them to hell, you are. And then encouraged him to do something about it. And Pearson goes on to describe that how it, this dialogue eventually led him to question his own faith, theology, and his mission as a minister. After his epiphany, Pearson uh, no longer was content with his wealth and status. And nor could he live his faith as he, as he had lived it all those years. So after researching the scriptures and praying and studying, he took his new revelation to his church leaders his closest friends and associates telling them that he felt the call to preach a new message, which eventually became the gospel of inclusion, a form of universalism that declared all people saved and loved by an all loving God. And I can tell you once he did that, all hell broke loose. Unable to let go of the doctrine of eternal damnation, the formerly faithful, faithful followers now began to depart and nearly 50 years of ministry started disintegrating right before his eyes. A council of bishops convened, resulting in him being excommunicated and labeled a heretic. The elite preachers and singers and leaders of Christendom, many of whom he helped uh, make famous, began to shun him. Attendance at his conferences, uh, his church dwindled, and the Azusa conference ended, and the church went into foreclosure. He lost absolutely everything. Sometimes moving from one stage will cost us friends, family, and wealth. But for some people, living their most authentic selves, It is well worth the price. And it was not that Pearson stopped preaching heaven or had some major moral failure. His fall came as a result of him having the audacity to offer an unconditional and unlimited grace by abandoning the notion of a fiery hell and a vindictive and angry God. So they kicked him out because He wanted to let hell go. And I like to say those who believe in hell like to create it in the lives of others. (laughs) Carlton would lose his church and would eventually end up worshiping at All Souls Unitarian Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And out of the 6,000 members that were there, only 600 Broken, wounded, and homeless Pentecostal universalists remained. (laughs) And I was one of them. I stayed. I will never forget the day we all arrived and had our first joint service together. Over 1,100 people packed in a 450-seat sanctuary, excited, scared, and hopeful of what was possible. The mere thought of two cultures of, and two congregations coming together, forging a way forward, was groundbreaking. Now, I have to be honest with you. I was praying that my people would keep things decent and in order. You see, Pentecostals are known to be a bit demonstrative. And certainly everyone from my group knew that it wasn't appropriate for you to speak in tongues. Something that's common among Pentecostals, which is very much like Buddhist chanting. (laughs) But soon as I thought, I had that thought, there it was. It was just silence in the church. It sounds a little bit like 
how do I tie my bow tie, right? <laughs> okay, so repeat after me. How do I tie my bow tie? You just spoke in tongues. <laughs> you can no longer be called a Unitarian. <laughs> and I was sitting there embarrassed, like with my head down, because it was right on my row, just a couple of feet down, and he was just yelling. I'm like, oh, goodness. Don't, you know, don't speak in tongues. But right then, there was an eight-year-old boy right behind us with his dad. And right in that moment, his dad began to create a context about what was happening. And he was telling his son, you see, son, that's a different way of worship. That's how other people do it. And in that moment, he was telling his son that it was okay what he was seeing. And he was like all of us with our mouths open and eyes big. But he was told by his dad that it was okay. And I thought, and I think he was saying that for all of us to hear. Because I lifted my head up and I was starting to feel really good about being there. But it was so amazing. I was thinking to myself, what kind of church is this? <laughs> and then I started reading a pamphlet from the pew back that read about the inherent worth and dignity of every person. I remember, remember reading something that, that said, here you can bring your whole self your full identity, your questioning mind, your expansive heart. Together, we create a force more powerful than one person or one belief system. As Unitarian Universalists, we do not have to check our personal background and beliefs at the door. We join together on a journey that honors everywhere we've been before. Now, I can tell you after two years of homelessness, that sounded rather refreshing. I thought to myself, hey, I'm home. But, th but this was to be short-lived. Because not everyone at the church proved to be as enlightened as this young father. After a few weeks, again, all hell broke loose. There were huge conflicts of culture, of class, and of religion. People started complaining. There was all kinds of side discussions about what was appropriate for worship. The drums were too loud. People clapped during and at the end of the sermon. <laughs> that was permission. <laughs> They raised their hands and swayed with the music. They even talked back to the minister. Amen. The Pentecostals started complaining about not feeling welcome. Certainly bringing our whole selves didn't mean assimilation. For some of them, the traditional worship style was too quiet and a little too boring. And what's up with that democratic approach to everything? Can't somebody just make a decision? That really drove us crazy. <laughs> but soon, I think everyone realized that living out those values were a lot more harder, more difficult than just stating them. And people started leaving the church from both sides, from both groups. The Pentecostals left believing that everyone was accepted in the Unitarian Church except Jesus and the African-American experience. Many of the Unitarians believing that they were losing their community, identity, and tradition departed as well. But what both groups that left failed to see that what they had in common was far more, that they had more in common than they had indifference. They had more in common. They failed to see that. But as you might imagine, I became even more disillusioned and desperate. And like many of those who left, I thought about giving in and leaving as well, but I hung around. Around the same time, I started seminary, and one of my professors drew me to her side after noticing my struggle in the class and said to me, Randy, for your life to work, you have to find a workable image of the divine. 
And she also encouraged me to read the book Stages of Faith, The Psychology of Human Development and the Quest for Meaning by Dr. James Fowler, who sadly passed away just last month. In his book, he talked about the evolution of one's faith, which also includes paths that lead to non-faith. From an intuitive project a projective childlike stage one to the ultimate universalizing stage six, where one demonstrates the ability to relate without condescension to anyone and any, at any stage and from any faith, realizing that the universal connectedness with everyone and everything. This was powerful stuff for me. And I realized that all that I was going through was necessary. And I thought that others were going through it, too, and they were trying to make sense of it. I was trying to make a positive shift, but I was stuck in the deconstruction stage of my faith, a process where you are examining your values and discovering and then removing falsehoods like faulty bricks out of a wall. There are empty spaces where the bricks of falsehood used to be. And if you're not careful, you may knock down the whole wall or the entire building may collapse. So you have to replace falsehoods, falsehoods with something else that works, but without compromising your integrity. It's a full blown construction process. And we all have been through it, must go through it or are going through it. But this led me to a major epiphany and, and subsequently to careful reexamining of my life, my faith and relationships, even to the acceptance of my sexual and racial identities. Although there may be a possibility of one's reaching the pinnacle of spiritual and ethical capacity through a steady, peaceful, overtime growth for many of us, It took being made uncomfortable. It took struggle and active working conscience. And yes, it took faith, a faith to get us to the next stage, to get us through faith, to grow a momentary, momentary epiphany or an awareness may cause us to go through years of having to reevaluate, to deconstruct and then reconstruct everything again. But if we allow this often painful process to take place and to carefully consider what our responses to the newly presented reality should be, as a result, we often gain wisdom and new vision that propel us to the next level of being. All things are indeed possible. So I stayed. We did the hard work. As a community... We came together and we held we held workshops and world cafes. We brought in consultants, encouraged home and caucus groups, conducted classes like witnessing whiteness and healing from fundamentalism. So both groups could address their issues with religion and culture. During the classes, some confessed that for them, the very mention of Jesus would make them quiver. One person expressed like nails clawing on a chalkboard. But as we dug deeper, most admitted that they had no issues with the authentic Jesus who himself broke with conventional wisdom of his day by denying bigotry, hatred, class and gender divisions and self-centeredness, which are the values that we espouse and adhere to in our movement. It was not Jesus that people cringed at. It was some negative past experience that they had with the followers of Jesus who claimed to be followers. We developed three distinct worship services so that each group would have a space for expression. The the traditional, contemporary, and the humanist. Okay, the contemporary was like the hand clapping and the moving and the swaying. And the traditional was like This right here. (laughs) And the humanists, they were just downright cool. (laughs) 
The people had space to express themselves, to grow and to evolve as they will. And then throughout the year, we held several all-church activities where all the groups came together in community as one. And we started noticing some marvelous things. People became more comfortable with the God language and even with the humanist language. Pentecostals eventually started attending the humanist service. And occasionally we would see agnostics and atheists in the contemporary service. And conversation was happening all over the campus. Religious, non-religious, Republican and Democrat, rich and poor came together. And despite their differences, they began to do the important reconstructive work. And we were noticed in our community because of it. The church survived. And right in the thick of it, the, the, what I call the buckle of the Bible belt, and with, while several other big mega churches were around with big name preachers, All Souls was twice voted the best place to worship in Tulsa. Yeah. Yeah, That deserves a hand clap. Because I'm not bragging about our church, or my former church. I'm bragging about our movement. You know what I'm talking about? Our movement deserves that. Because as I've traveled throughout the U.S., I've discovered similar struggles and subsequent triumphs in just about every UU community that I've had the pleasure to visit. Yes, I still run into those who are in need of reconstruction in their lives. And when I do, I share with them what's possible. I share with them of what happened in Tulsa. And I encourage them to continue to be what we hope someday the world will become. All things are indeed possible. With all that I have seen and experienced, I have good reasons to be bitter. And I'm sure that some of you here today have good reasons to be bitter. You probably have had some, I've heard the last service, there was a lot of stories like mine. But we are better, not bitter. We are better because we are choosing to stay together and do the work of justice, of tolerance, and of peace. Throughout our history, we have never been a static faith tradition. We've always been dynamic, ever-changing, deconstructing and reconstructing our faith. And there's no other denomination on this planet doing what we are doing and and what we have been doing for years. I'm patting you on the back. You need to be clapping, right? (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) We have been a place of refuge And continue to be a home for those who dare to question, like I did, their faith and doctrine. We realize, for those who are seeking answers to their questions, we know that the real truth and peace is in questioning all the answers. While some denominations are, cho- are closing their doors, drawing lines and taking sides, we must continue to open our doors and blur the lines and construct new pathways to a future of which we all can be proud. I leave you with two readings today. One is a quote from Reverend Carlton Pearson, and the other is from the singing, living singing from the living tradition, our hymnal. And I wanted to make note, (laughs) because after the first service, uh, Reverend Western came up and he said, but you just read the reading that my dad wrote. (laughs) And I thought that was quite amazing. Robert T. Weston. Weston. The first reading from Carlton Pearson. Life for most of us, if not all of us, is an ongoing experimentation with and of curiosity, discovery, and recovery of original self and soul. Once you lose curiosity, you begin to shrink, shrivel, and diminish inwardly. The stagnation leads to death or desolation, not resolution. You are an amazing reality, full of potential and renewed power. 
Get to know yourself all over again, perhaps for the first time. And then the second reading, number 650, cherish your doubts. And this one really helped me get through. But cherish your doubts. For doubt is the attendant of truth. Doubt is the key to the door of knowledge. It is the servant of discovery. A belief which may not be questioned binds us to terror, to error. For there is completeness and imperfection in every belief. Doubt is the touchstone of truth. It is an acid which eats away the false. Let no one fear for the truth that doubt may consume it. For doubt is a testing of belief. The truth stands boldly and unafraid. It is not shaken by the testing. For truth, if it be truth, arises from the testing stronger, more secure. Those that would silence doubt are filled with fear. Their houses are built on shifting sands. But those who fear not doubt and know its use are founded on rock. They shall walk in the light of growing knowledge. The work of their hands shall endure. Therefore, let us not fear doubt, but let us rejoice in its help. It is to the wise as a staff to the blind. Doubt is the attendant of truth. May it be so today.